Good morning. Welcome to NEEP's July Ready, Set, Scale webinar. I'm Ara Shure, NEEP's Executive Director, and I think we're going to have a big crowd today. This is NEEP's year-long webinar series highlighting policies, solutions, and programs that are ready to replicate and grow. Over the year, we've been covering lots of topics from new policies to innovative program models and technologies. I'm in Boston today. I'm in a new office in an old building. And if I look out the window, I can see several buildings that were built at least 150 years ago. Boston's original city hall now contains a steakhouse and the Parker House, Parker House Hotel, which was built in 1854, is still the Parker House Hotel. Much of our housing stock in the Boston area is of a similar vintage. The building I live in just turned 110 years old and it's a baby compared to some of the homes in Boston's historic suburbs. My point is that despite any academic idea of useful life, our homes and our buildings stick around. And most of the buildings that will be here in 2030, in 2050 and beyond are already built. So in order to meet our climate goals, we have to figure out how to retrofit existing homes and buildings to be low carbon, and to improve affordability and equity in this transition, we have to make our homes and buildings highly energy efficient, resi resilient to extreme weather, and safe for human health. So I'm gonna turn it over to John Balf, NEEP Senior Buildings and Community Solutions Manager, without delay to get the conversation started about whole home retrofits. Hi, John. Hey, Ara. thank you very much. You're teeing it up perfectly for us today. We're talking about existing buildings. We're talking about making retrofits uh, and I'm excited to be delivering this, this great webinar here today. So thank you very oh, much and we'll dive yeah. right in. Before I go, John, I had really, one really important thing to say to you. It's not only my, my house's birthday, it's your birthday today. So happy <laughs> birthday. I was hoping that would fly under the radar, but thank you yep, very much. No luck there. All right. <laughs> have a great webinar. Happy birthday. Thanks, Sarah. All right, excellent. So yeah, as Aira mentioned, my name is John Balf. I'm a senior manager on the buildings and community solutions team here at NEEP. Uh, and I'm excited to be delivering this webinar here today. Um, so just a couple of logistics. Uh, so we'll hear some opening remarks from our speakers and then we're gonna jump right into the, the discussion. That's what this is all about here today is uh, diving into a Q and A. Uh, I have some questions teed up, but we wanna hear from you all as well. So please, uh, send in any thoughts or questions right into the, the Q&A panel in the, the Zoom box there. Um, we are recording this webinar, so that'll be shared with folks afterwards uh, as well. And you may have noticed that there's a closed captioning feature in the Zoom panel, uh, so you can disable that or enable that, uh, whichever you prefer, by navigating down to, I think, the lower right-hand corner, uh, if you so choose. So those are a few housekeeping things. Um, as a nonprofit, we receive our funding through a variety of different sources. So I just wanna take a moment to acknowledge these organizations and companies that make our work in building decarbonization possible. So first is uh, Connecticut, uh, the Connecticut, uh, Connecticut Deep is the sponsor of this Ready, Set, Scale webinar series, enabling us to deliver this webinar once uh, per month over the course of the year. Next up, we have our private foundations in the US Department of Energy that provide us with specific grants to work on projects. Uh, and then we also have our allies network, which is our industry partners um, that work closely with us on a number of different initiatives, uh, one of which we'll hear from today. And then uh, lastly, uh, to all of our state partners uh, who support our work and collaborate with us, uh, we really appreciate all the support and, and funding over the, over the years. So I think that is all for slides that we'll have today. Uh, so we're really, um, you know, trying to trying to do without slides today. Um, and I'll just tee up our conversation. Uh, so we'll we're talking about this concept of the whole home retrofit. Uh, it's certainly not a brand new concept, but it does feel like there's a lot of buzz about this topic uh, around the NEEP region, around the country. And as we will hopefully hear today uh, about uh, some work on the international level as well. Um, so when I say whole home retrofit program, I'm talking about programs that go beyond just single energy upgrade projects in homes. Uh, these types of programs really seek deep energy savings um, by pairing multiple projects to together, multiple improvements into one larger comprehensive project that looks at well, the whole home. Uh, so you may also hear this called a one-stop shop model or a whole home decarbonization program. 
or a variety of other names, but generally speaking, these, these are the types of programs that we're talking about. Um, and they may pair together weatherization upgrades, electrification of end uses, um, you know, mainly heat pumps is, will be talked about a lot, um, and then potentially adding on-site renewable energy generation. Uh, so those are some of the things that come into the mix when we're talking about a whole home program. And then on top of that, um, these programs really are set up to overcome some of the upfront costs that homeowners may run into uh, by packaging uh, incentives or other financing and funding mechanisms into the program, as well as uh, streamlining the process for homeowners. That's a big, big component of these webinars, uh, sorry, of these programs, um, making there, there be one kind of primary point of contact for a homeowner so they're not having to go to multiple different uh, subcontractors or uh, you know programs that might be offering different incentives it's really bundled in a one-stop shop approach uh, so that they can overcome that hurdle of you know navigating the different waters here uh, when we're talking about these comprehensive projects uh, so that's what these programs are all about putting together all those pieces and really streamlining it for the homeowner so that's a little background about our topic. Um, for today's webinar, we're gonna be focusing on how these programs can truly scale up across the region. That's the, the theme of our webinar series and certainly hopefully something that will come through here today. So to do that, we're gonna look at three different programs that are really in various stages um, uh, across the NEEP region. And then, like I said, as well, uh, across um, globally uh, as well. So we'll take uh, we'll we'll take some lessons learned some best practices from these three different programs and hopefully there's little bits and pieces that everyone on the line uh, can learn about if you're interested in setting up a policy or a program related to whole homes uh, in the future so i'm going to first welcome uh, john kolesnik from the keystone energy efficiency alliance or kia uh, to talk about their work in pennsylvania to pass legislation for a statewide whole home repairs program. So John, welcome. It's uh, very exciting what's happening in Pennsylvania. Um, could you please describe a little bit about your work, your role, and uh, you know what, what program you have going on there in Pennsylvania? Absolutely. Uh, thank you, John. And uh, I really want to thank uh, Neep for hosting this webinar today. Uh, so as John said, my name is John Kolesnik. I'm policy counsel for the Keystone Energy Efficiency Alliance, or KIA. Uh, KIA is the trade association for the energy efficiency industry in Pennsylvania. Uh, with our sister organization, the Energy Efficiency Alliance of New Jersey, uh, we represent roughly 75 businesses of implementers, contractors, manufacturers, engineers, and architects um, between our two states. Uh, Kia Champions Energy Efficiency is a foundation of clean, just, and resilient energy economy. Uh, Kia's vision is that energy efficiency anchors all efforts to meet our ongoing needs, improve health and comfort, promote energy equality, and protect our climate. Uh, so I'm here today to speak about uh, what has just passed in Pennsylvania, which is the Whole Home Repairs Program. Uh, this program will establish a one-stop shop for home repairs and weatherization, at, all while uh, basically building out a local workforce and maintaining uh, family-sustaining jobs in this growing field. Uh, this piece of legislation is the, uh, or this, this program rather, is the first of its kind in the country uh, where Pennsylvania uh, really is taking a statewide approach. Uh, so originally, uh, the Whole Homes Repair Act uh, began as a piece of bipartisan legislation uh, earlier this year. Uh, ultimately, it was incorporated into Pennsylvania's annual budget and on July 28th received $125 million in funding. Now, the Whole Homes Repair Program will actually fund kind of three areas. Uh, the first is to ensure that homeowners uh, and renters can live in you know, properties that are free from habitability concerns. Uh, secondly, it'll improve coordination across existing home repair programs, utilizing braided funding with things like weatherization assistance program, low income home energy assistance program, low income usage reduction program, and other utility programs. And then third, uh, the focus is going to be, or the third focus rather, is going to be on increased retention of a workforce. Again, try to re, uh, improve communities where these projects will be taking place and ultimately building out that, you know, that local workforce, uh, you know, providing a dual benefit to, to these low-income, uh, you know, neighborhoods and areas. Now, uh, 
The program itself will actually provide opportunities for homeowners, landlords, and renters uh, by providing both grants and loans for both single family and multifamily properties. Uh, these awards for homeowners are in the form of a grant, which is up to uh, $50,000 per unit for homeowners uh, whose income does not exceed 80% of the median income in their area. And on the landlord side, uh, the awards are actually a, um, a loan up to, again, $50,000 uh, if the landlord uh, maintains that unit as an affordable, uh, you know, affordable housing unit effectively. Uh, some of the caveats there are that rent will be uh, contained within 3% uh, annually over the course of 15 years. Um, so really this is a focus to try and keep folks in their homes, keep people in their neighborhoods, uh, but provide those energy and energy efficiency improvements that are uh, desperately needed in Pennsylvania's housing stock. <clears throat> so kind of the goal of our program is to, uh, it is rather ex uh, expansive. Uh, for Kia personally, or, or Kia and our members rather, uh, we're really looking at this as a way to address the deferral rates uh, for, as I said, the weatherization and other utility run programs. Uh, roughly estimates are around 50% nationally uh, that customers who apply for these programs are placed on a deferral list uh, due to some health and safety, uh, basically health or safety or structural issue uh, in the home. So, and even that number is still kind of squishy, uh, primarily because there isn't a unified tracking system either on the state or federal level to really uh, determine what those deferral rates actually are. So that's essentially the, uh, the first line of, of attack uh, to really kind of implement this program and create that braided fund, those braided funding opportunities. Um, the, uh, the other measures like I, I stated before would be uh, incorporating the braided funding opportunities around weatherization assistance and uh, low income energy assistance programs uh, run by the utilities in Pennsylvania. Uh, so currently uh, the whole homes repair program uh, was funded back on July 28th. Uh, we are very excited for that to happen. And we are now currently in a holding pattern ish. Uh, so the community or sorry, the Department of Community Affairs and Economic Development uh, will be administering uh, this program. These are the same folks that also administer the weatherization assistance program in Pennsylvania. Uh, so at this point, the uh, DCED is really putting together procedures on how these, these funding sources will be allocated across the state uh, through the various counties. Uh, we're anticipating it to be laid out pretty similarly to the way the weatherization assistance program is, which uh, effectively has a centralized coordinated uh, nonprofit or governmental agency in each county uh, to then provide the one-stop point of contact uh, for these improvements, both to the homes, uh, for the coordinated training for workforce, and then ultimately um, to the other wraparound services as well. Uh, so we are very excited uh, with the progress that Pennsylvania has made thus far. We're really excited to see what happens this fall when this project starts to get up and running. Um, this was a one-time funding source, so ultimately we are really looking for success stories to, uh, you know, show this down the line and continue to get funding as things progress. So uh, with that, John, I will uh, send it back to you. Yeah, thank you very much, John. And we'll, uh, we'll be diving deeper into, uh, you know, how, how you got buy-in for the legislation, how there was bipartisan agreement on that and some of the other aspects of the program. But I think for now, that's a, a good overview. So thank you very much. Um, next, we are going to hear from what's happening in Massachusetts. So I will welcome uh, Dave Betcher uh, on screen here from Abode Energy Management, who's working on the Massachusetts uh, decarbonization uh, Pathways pilot program. So Dave, tell us a little bit about what's happening uh, with your work in Massachusetts, please. Great. Thanks, John. Um, and John, thanks for giving an overview of what's happening in Pennsylvania. Sounds like good, interesting stuff. And thanks to Neep for uh, putting this, this series of presentations on. Uh, it's great to be uh, in, involved and we're proud to be a, a sponsor, an industry partner of, of Neep's and all the good work that you guys do. So I'm here, um, Founder and president of Abode Energy Management. I should start my timer here. 
uh, of Abode Energy Management, and we are a, a consulting firm that works with um, the local New England, mostly region currently, utilities running energy efficiency programs, um, and we do a lot of heat pump consulting at various levels with customers, with municipalities, and across state levels. Um, and we are working in collaboration with Mass CEC uh, for the decarbonization uh, pathways pilot, which uh, I'll dive into here. So the we are, we're happy to be partnered with Mass CEC. This is a great initiative that's um, trying to lay out a roadmap, a clear and simple roadmap, uh, simplifying a very complicated process for customers to decarbonize their homes uh, in Massachusetts. It's a small pilot program that's uh, just, just launching now. There's an initial cohort of 30 customers. Uh, we're in the selection process of, of those customers currently. And it's for single family homes, for um, residential retrofit single family homes and triple decker or um, up to four unit buildings. One of the goals is to get a few triple deckers to actually add a unit uh, as part of the process uh, while, they're, while they're decarbonizing. Uh, so there's a very robust statewide program in Massachusetts, Mass Save, for, for those of you that, that know it. Uh, it does a great job of addressing energy efficiency uh, at a uh, comprehensive level. It, it, it gets uh, deep for some customers, but it's a menu of services that uh, is an offering. If you have items that are applicable in your home, uh, great, it works for you but it's not a decarbonization program and it's not a custom energy audit program. What we're trying to do here is design a decarbonization program that can be layered on to the core Mass Save program. There's no sense in competing with Mass Save in, in Massachusetts. It's such a strong program. So we're trying to design a, uh, a bolt on to the Mass Save process that allows us to give customers a clear roadmap of the actions that need to take. We're trying to get them to understand the steps involved. It's the full, full suite of decarbonization, weatherization and heat pumps are mandatory. And then in this pilot, uh, pilot cohort, and then it addresses hot water, transportation, both vehicles and alternative transportation, water heating, cooking, um, lawn equipment. So it's the full suite of, of decarbonization. That's a lot for a customer to take in. So we give them, an overview of their path. We put it all down on a piece of paper and a report that's clear and legible that simplifies the process for them. And then we're around for follow-on consulting when they're ready to act. We can't give customers every piece of information they need to fully decarbonize their house and have them retain it, likely. Uh, a few customers will be able to do that and be ready to act all at once, but we're trying to have them decarbonize over time and be a resource uh, for them to avoid making a mistake, we want to avoid the situation where their water heater dies and they call the plumber down the street and they've reset the clock and they missed the opportunity to electrify that piece of equipment. Uh, so we're um, providing follow-on services and a whole host of resources that will give customers uh, access to the information they need when they're ready to act. Um, that's the what we're trying to learn. Uh, we're trying to iterate as we go. And uh, this is a, a pilot. Uh, we'll figure out what works and we'll make tweaks as we go. And hopefully in six months or a year, we'll have a lot of learnings uh, and adaptations to make it an even more successful program that's able to scale in, in the future. Um, that's a, a quick Try to keep it under five minutes. Uh, over overview of, of what we're trying to achieve, and um, look forward to getting into all the all the questions. Yeah, thank you very much, Dave. Uh, makes sense to you know layer it onto the Mass Saves program, uh, and you know provide customers with that information so that they can act when the, the time is right at you know the point of a system failure. Um, you know, I think having that infill in front of you is critical. Um, so, so you know, cool. Uh, cool to see that that's the model uh, happening in Massachusetts. And yeah, we'll, we'll dig in more in a moment here. Um, 
we've Thanks. seen a couple of questions come into the chat box already. If you have additional questions, feel free to put them into the Q&A box uh, would be the best place, but you can also dump them in the chat box as well. Um, all right, so I will introduce our third uh, speaker, Stephen Farrell from the Sustainable Energy Authority of Ireland, joining us from across the pond. Uh, so thank you, Stephen, for being with us here today to talk about uh, some of your learnings there in Ireland. Um, so yeah, tell no us a little bit about uh, the program that you have going on over there. Great, thanks, John. Great to be here. Apologies for running a bit late. The usual uh, reliance, so I'll get through no problem in Zoom <laughs> until the time comes. Um, but come here, thanks a million for the invite, John. Um, and it's great to be a part of this whole discussion and, and sharing learnings and ways of doing things either side of the Atlantic. It's just brilliant link up. Um, a bit about me then. I'm, I'm working for the Sustainable Energy Authority of Ireland. Um, and the role the Sustainable Energy Authority of Ireland have is we're a trusted partner with, with citizens, communities and buildings um, to deliver on solutions to move people to a more sustainable energy um, environment. Um, I suppose we're at the heart of delivering Ireland's um, energy revolution and driving the replacement of fossil fuels usage from all sectors of society. And I suppose where we're at now is we have this huge target set by the Climate Action Plan and government um, of meeting our, our carbon reduction targets by the end of the decade, 2030. Um, and that amounts to 500,000 homes up to a B2 level. And um, we have a building energy rating where A rating is the, the most energy efficient home and a G rating is, is the poorest in terms of energy efficiency. So we have a a cost optimal level decided by a technical group saying if we can get 500,000 homes to a B2 level and 400,000 heat pumps installed in homes, um, where that's a metric that we set to meet our 2030 target. Now, in doing that, we should try and convince all these homeowners to, to engage with us and undertake these deep retrofit projects, which are complex and expensive. So we've established a new program um, as of the start of spring, so February uh, this year, and it's the one-stop shop service. So that's the program I'm running. And our aim is to have that service in a way where it can deliver 50,000 homes per annum to that B2 mark come the middle of the decade. So that's 50,000. Um, now, in doing that, we had to unlock a number of key barriers in terms of the challenges and the intimidation, say a homeowner getting into a whole retrofit project, the cost, the information side of it, the affordability side of it. So we're working uh, with, with actors called One Stop Shops and the professional retrofit companies that have proved their worth in terms of the financial stability, the professionalism, technical ability and so forth. And um, we've also introduced a home energy assessment, which is a part of the, the first step in terms of the one-stop shop journey. So that gives the homeowner the knowledge um, they need to make the decision in terms of what measures are needed to be get it to a B2, the technical design, very importantly, the cost um, and the duration of the works and so forth. So that's the whole information side. So removing that complexity from the homeowner then the one-stop shop comes in and it's the one point of contact for the homeowner. So the one-stop shop will manage all the works, the quality of the works, the contractor coordination, uh, the quality assurance, the grant administration side, technical requirements, all the way up to the final BR at the end, proving that the house is better than the B2. And so we've removed that complexity from the homeowner, the coordination efforts, that uncertainty because we brought in professional uh, one-stop shops in place to do all that. And then the third part of it is the affordability side of it. So we have grants up to 35K to bring a, a detached, house up, detached house up to a, a B2 energy rating. Um, now, the key that we found is that the grant needs to be deducted up front to make it affordable for the homeowner. So just to give you an example, if the works cost 60,000 um, and the grant comes to 35, the homeowner only has to find 25,000. Okay, so it immediately becomes more affordable. Um, and I suppose we won't get anywhere if, if we don't drive the supply chain and drive interest. So we've, we've done that by increasing our grant amounts that have created phenomenal interest 
And that has brought about a lot of callers and homeowners into these one-stop shop entities. And then there they get the confidence that there's work out there. And supplemented by that is government's commitment at a policy level and a financial level to guarantee funding of, of 8 billion between now and 2030. So all that reinvigorates and stimulates the economy. The, the contractors and workers out there see that there's a 10 year plan here, a continuity of work surety that that is applied all across, I suppose, Ireland in terms of the size of it is, is, is minuscule compared to the states. But every county in Ireland, every town in Ireland has homes that need to be retrofitted. So there's work and a driven demand for work in urban areas in large areas and real rural areas. This is all across the board. So it's it's about stimulating homeowners interest, their awareness in energy efficiency, but also stimulating the supply chain to buy into this and see this as a, a long term plan and a, a good way to to make business and set their business in that direction. And um, so that's the scheme we're running. We've developed it. It's been in place since February. And um, we have 11 one stop shops on the register. We're trying to get it up to 20 this year with a view of having 20, 30, 40, 50 um, as the decade progresses. And all that will multiply, have a multiply effect. And with all these one stop shops, they have to have an element of scale year on year. So like currently, just to give you a metric, we, we currently have, say, 8,000 B2s, but in a short in a short while, over 24 months, they'll be looking for 25,000. So there's huge targets and challenges ahead. And um, so that's just a bit of a rundown in terms of what we're doing here, the program and how we're, we're looking to scale and have maximum input in terms of homeowners retrofit journeys and doing their own bit for, for carbon uh, reduction and so forth. Great, thank you, Stephen. We just got a quick clarifying question. Uh, how much is budgeted over 10 years? Uh, this person missed the, the budget number that you stated. Eight, eight billion. Eight billion. Yeah, eight billion. So, okay. so, and that's that's under our national development plan, our national development plan, um, and it's key that 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 was called out front and center. So, the supply chain and businesses see that money is guaranteed all year round, so they can buy into that level of certainty that there will be grant support there, driving homeowners to upgrade their homes and so forth. Mm -hmm. Got it. So thank you. All right, so we're getting some questions in. I just want to I'll welcome uh, Dave and John to join us back on camera here so we can dive into the, the general discussion. Hey so, hey, there we all are. Um, so I have a question just about obstacles that your programs were designed to overcome. I'm sure there are many. I'm wondering if each of you could maybe pick one of the, the top challenges uh, that you tried to design or work into these programs um, you know, what were some of the concerns that you heard from stakeholders, whether those were, um, you know, legislators or homeowners, contractors, whoever it might have been? What's one challenge that you heard and how did the, the program that is being developed or uh, that's already been implemented, how did that overcome that obstacle? Uh, so, John, do you want to start if you've got one ready to yeah. go? Yeah, I can uh, certainly jump in. And I think this might actually address uh, Troy's, com or Troy's question in the chat as well. Um, so really around the structural and health and safety concerns of, uh, all the homes in, in Pennsylvania, specifically Philadelphia and Pittsburgh has some of the oldest housing stock in the nation. Um, and because of this, a lot of individuals are, like I said, are placed on these deferral lists. Um, so really seeing community groups, uh, you know, invigorate it, uh, to support this piece of legislation, uh, our members have spoken out, uh, on this as well, uh, really kind of uh, some of the heartbreaking stories we've heard where a, you know, a contractor goes out to a home to do a weatherization project. Um, they find out that there's just an expansive amount of mold in, in the home. And by weatherizing that house, it would, it would just sim simply exacerbate the entire situation. However, because the weatherization funding doesn't necessarily permit for mold remediation, uh, they're, they're now forced to kind of walk away from a project where, you know, this resident is now knows that they're living in a home with mold and having some other kind of, you know, energy burden, some other possibly structural issues with their home and really not being able to provide any, any form of help. So really one of the big focuses here was to, you know, really push that forward to advance, um, you know, 
advance those types of projects that can can could be remediated and could be addressed uh, to really uh, expand the use of the other programs like the weatherization assistance program um, in Pennsylvania. So, I mean, that was one of the, the big uh, charging points around uh, some of the support that we received uh, in this legislation. Yep, makes a lot of sense. Thank you. Steven, since you're off mute, do you want to talk about one of your major obstacles yeah, you encountered? I suppose uh, our major, major obstacle would be given homeowners I suppose incentivizing them first of all enough to make them kind of interested in in transitioning from um, say a fossil fuel boiler to a heat pump technology but and, and we had to equalize out that equation where um, they could buy a, a gas boiler for, for four thousand say and or, or they could transition to a heat pump for uh, 15 16 k and um, so that whole difference between the two technologies it nearly was a no-brainer anyone with a kind of a constrained budget would would always go for the gas boiler or the oil boiler so we had to introduce grant incentives to balance that out and currently um i suppose since the launch of the scheme we would have a heat pump and a radiator boiler support scheme in the order of a grant of 10k 10 and a half k so it immediately equalizes that whole uh, finance amount so it's getting people to think about transitioning to to that um low carbon technology but another part would be the information side homeowners were so intimidated by entering into a, a large complex retrofit project here and um, we had to make sure that the homeowner had the right level of information to make that decision and um, so we we introduced a home energy assessment which is a comp comprehensive report that we present to a homeowner uh, before any works takes place and it gives them a, a building energy assessment of their home currently so it says their home is at an e rating and um, we do a technical design in terms of what measures are suitable to bring that house up to a b2 or an a rated house and um, we also assess their house for heat pump suitability in terms of what needs to be done to make sure the heat pump operates efficiently looking at their heat loss through their fabric and their ventilation systems. And most importantly, we give them a, a quote to complete the work so they can enter into the, the whole project knowing that this is going to cost X amount of money. And that home energy assessment report gives them the knowledge to go forward or actually say, oh, this is outside my budget range. I need to go more incremental approach down one of our own, other scheme routes. Um, so we found when we presented those those options to the homeowners and that bit of clarity and uh, they were more bought into it and they kind of entered into the whole project with their eyes open in terms of how much it's going to cost with the confidence that a good technical design was done before they entered into and uh, before they commenced any work. Got it. Dave, yeah. pass it over to you. Yeah, uh, much much like Stephen was saying, I think the, the biggest um challenge in the in this marketplace is it's it's complicated it's just a really confusing complicated complex uh thing to achieve and giving customers so we we're trying to overcome that through the clarity during the energy assessment both the mass save with the decarbonization tacked on uh a clear simple roadmap that allows the customer to visualize their journey through this a few people raise their hands early and say, yeah, let's go for a full deep energy retrofit. And they have a lot of money up front and they have a general contractor and they handle it all for them. That's not a large scale uh, or that's not a scalable approach. So you give customers a clear roadmap where they really understand what their path is. And then you need, there's a lot of contracts, a lot of great contractors out there, but there's also contractors that are actively selling against decarbonization because that's what they're used to and it's easier and um, that's what they know. And so you need to have an informed contractor network as well. And so building a kind of curated network of contractors that you can start to uh, trust and rely on to be recommending the right things because customers are not the expert and they need to, you, you need to arm them also with what to, how to interact with contractors so that they can be informed when and push back when the contractor is giving them maybe not the right decarbonization advice. Mm -hmm. and then providing uh, that follow on support when customers do have questions and they're about to make a decision. It's hard to learn everything you need to learn about EVs or about 
uh, heat pumps all in one visit on one day. And so providing those resources that are accessible for the customer on their own, following links, one pagers that outline everything, not everything they need to know, but give them, arm them to be informed enough to make the right decision and build their confidence that they're making the right decision because there's a lot of, it's easy to say, oh, I'm not confident with what's going on. I'm just not going to act. Uh, and so you need to give them the resources to be confident. So that just-in-time services to help hold their hand, get them over that final hurdle of comparing a couple quotes for heat pumps, helping them digest what the right option is. And so it's really that simplifying and providing customers the resources and the contractor base needed to allow them to act successfully. Yeah, makes a lot of sense. Steven, I know you've done a lot in terms of like contractor, um, I believe you called it, was it registration? Yeah. Uh, so maybe you could talk a little bit more about that. I think that's a really course. interesting no. approach here. Yeah, no problem. And it, it kind of ties in what Dave is saying in terms yeah. of you need you need good people on board that, that the homeowners see as professional and, and they trust and they have a good customer journey processes in place. So we, I suppose, ultimately, we take on these um, one-stop shops, we call them, and they need to be able to deliver a professional service from end to end. Um, so that's from the homeowner calling in, generating their own demand uh, by marketing uh, a retrofit service, all the way to bring the homeowner through the whole customer journey right up to the BR at the end where the homeowner's left uh, after uh, after works pack of information and the, the their BER. But we, we have to make sure we get the right one-stop shop registered. So we have a fairly robust registration uh, process in place like we, we could have 600 people on the register fairly fast if we didn't, but um, currently we're growing it. We're hoping to touch 20 towards the end of the year, but the two-step process is the first step is we have to make sure that the one-stop shop is financially stable. They have the insurances in place, the appropriate organizational structure, uh, environmental policies, health and safety policies. So it's really a sense check and their financial probity and um, how they're set up and they have the correct policies and structures in place. Um, and if they if they meet those yes, no criteria, which includes that we look for a minimum turnover of, of a million um, euro per annum for two consecutive years. So it shows a level of financial stability because we have to make sure that these providers can withstand that upfront cost that they're taking off from the homeowner. Okay, so that's that's, looking at the business as a whole and how stable and, and, and professional it is. Then we move, if they pass that stage one, they move into the stage two assessment where we look at their whole strategic plan in terms of their mission and vision for the next um, nine, eight, eight, nine years, their whole risk management, their SWOT analysis and so forth, their, their approach to the quality management system. They have to have a quality management system that's signed off by an ISO 9001 expert. Um, their whole service delivery and PM expertise, their technical resources and their data managers. There's a whole suite of criteria that we assess out of a, out of a metric. And if they, meet, if they meet that bar, then they, they, they become a registered one-stop shop. And it's so important we get that right because each of these one-stop shops need to be able to scale and they need to be able to have the correct structures in place where the day-to-day -day work is is standard. They know what they're doing. The process is set and they can focus on additional marketing, their growth. They can do 200 homes this year. We want them to scale to 350 next year and so forth. And we get confidence through that strategic plan that they submit and that we rate that, that they'll be able to do that. So if, if we get the wrong type of one-stop shop in place, it can create quality issues and it can do more harm than good. We all know poor work spreads like wildfire and people are talking and then people even get more weary of the whole retrofit approach. So we're trying to keep it in terms of a high professional uh, one-stop shop service because these one-stop shops are guaranteeing a grant of possibly 25, 30, 35 K for a homeowner. So they're responsible for a lot of money and delivering the, the ser service correctly. And so that's how we ensure, or we hope we're ensuring we're getting the right one-stop shops in place. And that list will grow between now and the end of the decade and hopefully uh, beyond. Great. Thank you, Stephen. Well, yeah, we're get, uh, we've got a few questions about um, the different financing models and braiding funding together. 
uh, one particularly about uh, do any of these programs support a lease finance model instead of a, a loan based financing via a third party. So maybe each of you could just touch on where where funding comes from, you know, how you're braiding it together. What are what are the options that you're you know, taking a look at for these programs? Um, anyone want to jumpstart that? Sure. Happy to. Thanks, Dave. Um, so this is a, a, a pilot program and the funding is coming through the Mass CEC, which is um, funded by rate, rate payers in Massachusetts. And uh, the there's no lease lease option um, in, in the current iteration. There's just a quick overview of the financials. There's three tiers. There's uh, it's income, customer income dependent, and uh, above 120 of every median income, there's a $10,000 uh, additional incentive on top of the already very generous mass save incentives for weatherization and heat pumps and all of the other um, items de that are incentivized uh, or decarbonization items that are incentivized to mass save. And then if you're uh, 80 to 120, there's a $20,000 kicker on top of all the mass save and mass save also gets more and more generous uh, as income levels go down. And then if you're below 80, there's a $30,000 incentive on top of the uh, mass save. And so it's a, it's a generous incentive. It's all, it's available for one year. So we're trying to get customers to weatherize and do heat pumps, at least in the first year. Uh, ideally, they would take advantage of the full, um, the full incentive in that first year and then um, find new funding sources or pay out of pocket for the smaller items going forward. Heat pumps, the biggest, biggest chunk. Um, yeah or deeper weatherization. Yeah. Got it, thanks. And John, how are you all thinking about, you know, you've, you've mentioned, I guess, braiding funding together. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, where, where are the different buckets coming from? Certainly, uh, so the primary uh, source of funding for this was ARPA funding uh, in the Pennsylvania budget. Um, it was kind of a perfect storm in PA this year. We had in excess of $10 billion surplus in the budget. Um, so that in, in conjunction with several other uh, factors really helped kind of promote this project um, in its first year. Uh, so at least the initial funding on this is $125 million. Uh, like I mentioned, the grants for homeowners are, rough, are up to $50,000. Uh, and those are, uh, you know, just straight up grants uh, if you're under the 80% median income for the area uh, for landlords. It is a forgivable loan, um, so really it is trying to maximize uh, the energies and inputs uh, from, you know, basically to to get homes up to qualifying for then the weatherization program, uh, which uh, has its own funding source uh, administered through federal funding as well as uh, supplemental state, and then each of the utility programs um, in Pennsylvania we have Act One Twenty Nine uh, in which the electric utilities. Uh, have energy efficiency programs and varying qualifying for low income customers as well. Um, so part of the Whole Homes Repair Act uh, will effectively aid uh, customers uh, kind of through that whole process. Uh, so, you know, basically that, that the funding part of that becomes uh, that one stop shop uh, to kind of direct the customer base to be able to maximize all of those other funding streams uh, so that they're effectively not going from, you know, one department to the next and um, trying to create an ease of access and reduce some of those barriers to entry there. And John, will it be the, you said the like nonprofits or government entities that might be helping be that one-stop shop there? The, like, what yeah, that, that's what's stuff. anticipated at this okay. point. Um, and that, that's what the legislation laid out. Uh, so we're still in that process of who exactly will be the designated point of contact in each county. Okay. Got it. Yeah. And Steven, you've yeah. got some great buy-in from uh, the national the, yeah, the the development government. plan. Yeah. We, we, yeah. We, we got allocated 250 million this year um, out of a pot of, of 8 billion that has been allocated in advance to our national development plan and um, sent to us. Our problem here is that, we, we have this money to spend, but we're trying to get the supply chain and the homeowners buy in and the workers there to spend it. Um, we, we have a, we've simplified our grant approach. So we've all that money in the pot and it's allocated out to a number of schemes. So one of the schemes is kind of a single measure upgrade 
people want to do their upgrade works bit by bit. A lot of people don't have that 60, 70 K budget. And uh, that's an individual grant scheme. And there's a grant amount per measure based on your house type. We've broken the four house types down into mid terrace, semi D, detached and apartment. Then we've about 15 measures down the side and we have a, a fixed commoditized grant linked to each of those. Um, we also have a, a program for uh, homeowners that are deemed energy poor. So who are in receipt of um, the fuel allowance or other social welfare supports, um, they can get their home upgraded um, free. So it's a free upgrade service. But the majority of people fall into the, the can pay, so the non-energy poor sector. So we'll say the average grant, if you looked at everything as a whole, we give attic insulation out at an 80% grant, cavity wall insulation at an 80% grant. But if you look at a full retrofit as a whole, it's roughly 50% of the cost to upgrade through the one-stop shop service, which is the full house retrofit. Um, and those grants can min out at, say, 14,000 and max out at um, 35,000, depending on what measures are required to get your house up to that that level but in, in terms of funding um that national development plan uh, eight billion certainty is there to ensure that the supply chain know it's there it's continuous for the remainder of the decade albeit now anything can go wrong but if everything stays stable that it's there um and it gives the supply chain confidence to buy into this work continuity um throughout the year year on year previous to um previous to this kind of assurance by the government we use work on nearly six month cycles so um our contractors would be busy between april and october but then they'd be applying for support between october and uh, march so how, how could you expect them to scale at that stop start nature so we we had to try and um uh, um, reduce that risk and, and eliminate it and we could only do that by that um, large amount of, of funding that has been that has been uh, assured to us through the national development plan thank you we've got a couple of questions around cultivating new uh, one-stop shop or contractors and you know Stephen, i maybe you have the most experience doing this so far yeah. um so you know, important how do, you, it, it, yeah, it's, how, uh, how do you get new folks on board yeah new for like, like we have we we have and it's probably the same we use our use have your trusted providers and retrofitters that you see delivering all the time and they're getting better and better and bigger and bigger and they're getting the majority of grants because they have the resources and the expertise to go through we, we have a lot of them registered at the minute and there's a few more to be registered and they're nearly the the low-hanging fruit and um, but it's engaging with broadening that whole supply chain and engaging with say new build contractors contractors who who are working on new build developments um, uh, greenfield construction sites and so forth trying to get them on board so uh, we actually have a resource employed employed on um, certain departments um, so the department of further education research and innovation we, we've, we've programs in place to try and increase the number of apprenticeships uh, coming on board so that's all building the supply chain but we reach out to each of these individual um one-stop shops that are expressing interest and we talk them through the whole registration process um, and so forth and what it's all about so they enter into this whole process um i suppose with their, with their eyes open but we also have kind of schemes smaller schemes as such where they can break their teeth in terms of and managing energy retrofit projects, managing 20, 30 projects over a contract period and building that experience and giving them, I suppose, the awareness of where they need to be to become a one-stop shop so they can grow their, their expertise and their quality systems and so forth to be able to apply to become a one-stop shop in six months, a year, 18 months, whatever suits their whole business growth. And um, so we're continuously engaging with the likes of Engineers Ireland and the, the Construction Feder uh, Industry Federation and so forth, trying to reach out to the, the new build sector um, and different construction 
um, providers to try and make them aware of, I suppose, the benefits and the surety of grant funding that's there to make them direct our business towards retrofitting and becoming a one-stop shop. Um, but it's an ongoing task, John, and there's a number of things that have to come together in terms of um, the, the one-stop shops that are engaged need to be able to employ, employ experienced kind of workers, apprenticeships, transition their, their, their mechanical specialists from fossil fuel boilers to heat pump technology, um, all those things that have to be put together. But it, it's kind of, it's really engaging with them and talking them through the whole registration process and what, what it's needed to become a one-stop shop and then setting out a plan over six months, over a year or how they can, they can reach the mark to becoming a one-stop shop. Um, if that, if that kind of covers where you were looking at, John. Yeah, absolutely. I think, you know, the, there's a need for a lot of different levels to engagement. Um, yeah. And, you know, a lot of effort needs to be put into that. Uh, Dave or John, do you have any thoughts on cultivating new one-stop shops or well, take it in a different direction? Yeah. I mean, we, we work on onboarding co contractors through a number of programs we run uh, constantly and uh, we're, we're out there. We, we're, we sort of interview them and uh, ensure that they understand they have the right intent of, of uh, how they operate. And then we work with them through, throughout the process and the contractors that are wanting to grow or, or wanting to do the right thing um, really appreciate the the oversight and the QC and the feedback and the back and forth and so we're getting uh, better contractors or contractors that are that are doing higher quality work kind of self self-selecting into the programs and the ones that aren't gonna they're gonna get caught not doing the right thing uh, sort of self-select out when we when we do the interview process that's not uh, building a huge network of contractors because um, we don't have enough that are willing to kind of be subjected to the, uh, the oversight. Um, but as we're trying to transition the marketplace where more and more customers are asking for these uh, retrofits and so the contractors need to get on board in order to continue to grow their business um, and, and, and find the work. And so uh, you know, we, we try to, take a collaborative approach uh, with the contractors as well, as well, and really hold their hand um, when needed to help them, help them get where they need to be. And then they, they say, thanks. And um, hopefully they tell their, tell their friends and more contractors get on board. Yep. Makes sense. Yeah. That, that, that is key. If I could come in there, guys, that, that's key in terms of the field that, that you're, they're being supported to grow and progress, but in terms of cultivating, uh, and I kind of noticed this cultivating one-stop shops and, and retrofitters to get on board, and I noticed it um, since our program was launched in February, there's nothing more powerful than them getting 50 calls a day from interested homeowners looking to upgrade their homes. Um, and the providers are calling me saying, I've, I have 150 leads now on my book. Um, how, do I, how do I become a one-stop shop? Um, so it, it's 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 essential that the demand is there, um, um, and and they're calling these retrofit providers, and it gets them really activated, saying I can I can direct my business in this in this way, and I can make money out of it, and, and this is this is fairly stable. And um, so that's what I found is getting a lot of uh, how a lot of providers are touching base with SEI. It's it's due to the demand out there, and they want to get involved in it and so forth and it kind of cultiv cultivates itself naturally then yeah makes sense go ahead john yeah uh, and just real quick for uh for us uh the incorporation of um using the uh department of economic and uh community development uh that already has those pre-existing um, established connections with the weatherization suppliers in each county is really kind of at least kind of the starting point and we're excited to see and, and work with them in developing this new procedure uh, but the whole home repair project also uh, provides for cash stipends for trainees, as well as uh, mm -hmm. some costs related around pre-apprenticeship, apprenticeship programs uh, to really onboard and have, provide on-the-job training for that contractor network to kind of build out their workforces as well. Um, so again, we're still in the early stages of it, but um, the fact that there is workforce built into this program, I think is uh, super important to really you know, grow this, this industry. 
one other just super quick note, uh, helping contractors understand that the scope of the job can be bigger. Uh, there was just a question on stripping off siding and continuous insulation and roofing. And ideally, instead of just slapping on a new roof, uh, that contractor, we're looking for contractors that will be able to do the full suite of exterior work so that you don't do part of your project, close that contractor walks away, and then you realize, oops, I should have integrated some other continuous insulation when I just did my siding. And so we want contractors that can deliver a larger scope um, of exterior services instead of just their one one aspect of a job. So hopefully they are. We're, we're finding that as well. Guys, we, we, we've we, we've one shop, one stop shops on board and some of them are energy retrofit experts. So they can go into an existing house and, and retrofit it with a heat pump, fabric upgrades and so forth. But then there's the ask where if someone's doing a 50, 60K energy retrofit upgrade, they're also building that extension at the side. Um, and a lot, and a number of the, the one-stop shops, that creates a, a level of complexity because that's not their forte. And um, so, so it, it's, it's trying to get the right mix of people on board so they can go to the, the pure energy retrofit guy who's just up, upgrading the existing footprint of the house or they have an option to go down the route of um, a one-stop shop that kind of has a builder background, a construction background that can do, do it all. And um, so we're, we're kind of battling with that as well. Um, but hopefully when the panel, our panel matures and um, more option will be there. So homeowners can select the, the, the correct one-stop shop. Great. All right. I know we're coming up on the top of the hour here. Um, maybe really briefly, each of you could just state in a year where you hope to be with these programs, you know, just in a, in a couple words, uh, Steve, I'll, Steve, I'll start with you. Uh, yeah. Um, um, we, we hope to um, have about, we've 11 one sub shops on board. Now it started with zero five and now we're at 11, thank God, 12. And we, we hope to have about 20 one stop shops on board come the end of the year. Um, and we're hoping to do in the order touching 15 to 20, um, 50, 15 to 20,000 deep retrofit um, wow. homes per annum um, over the next eight, 12 to, to 18 months. Um, awesome. So that's the ongoing challenge to see that number of B2 retrofits exponentially rise towards the middle of the decade yep. and then plateau um, to, to the end of the decade. That's great. Thank you. Dave, how about you a year from now? Yeah, I have uh, cohort one done and cohort two um ideally done or move, moving through the process with lots of learnings of, of what worked and what needs to be um, addressed. And we'll update between cohort one and cohort two to um, whatever needs to be uh, changed. Yeah. In a year, we'll have uh, lots of learnings that we can then apply to um, implement a, hopefully a statewide program, whether it's in mass or, or elsewhere uh, to approach this at scale. Yes, great. And John, legislation just passed, but a year from now, where are you going to be? Legislation just passed. Uh, we're, we're hoping to have the program stood up in, you know, across the state and in every county, if possible. Um, and unfortunately, the legislation passed with a, you know, a single year budget funding. Uh, so really, we're looking for, you know, this project to be successful, this program to be successful in year one, um, so that we can then take that back to the legislator next year and say, look at all the good we've done for all the constituencies and we need to keep funding this program. Yeah, I think that'll be important all the way around showing the benefits that these programs are having, you know, the energy impacts, the cost savings, hopefully the health benefits yeah. along the way as well. Uh, so I'm excited to follow each of these and, you know, take the lessons learned and share them with the rest of the stakeholders that we have on this call here and, and beyond. Um, so Stephen, Dave, John, thank you all very much uh, for participating in this and sharing your wisdom. Uh, it was really good stuff. And yeah, we look forward to, to hearing more about these programs. Um, I know we've got a minute left. Uh, we do have one more, or our next Ready, Set, Scale webinar is going to be happening in August on the 16th. And this is all about um, equity metrics. So building these, these important metrics and, and ways to measure these metrics in programs uh, going forward to make sure that outcomes are equitable. Uh, so feel free to register for that. We'll follow up with the recording. Uh, another huge thank you to all of our speakers and everyone for participating in this, uh, this webinar here today. So enjoy the rest of the day and thank you again. No problem. Thanks. Bye. All the best. Be well. Bye.